<clears throat> well, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. Uh, this could be a very different lesson from the normal format, especially if you saw what I have written down um, in my notes here. But the slightly different thing that I think I would like to do for this morning particularly is to invite you, if you felt comfortable, um, to move a little bit closer to the front. That would be a real help to me, um, and it might help us to feel a little bit more of a a group together, so if you're able to do that and you feel comfortable doing that, um, let's, let's just do that for a moment. It'll also help us if we get into sharing um, various aspects on this subject. It'll help us just to hear one another a little bit better. So thank you for indulging me in that. Appreciate it. I can actually see people's faces now and if they're smiling or frowning. So um, uh, we'll see how the lesson goes. So there's a little bit of a play on words in the title that's up on the board. Prayer matters or prayer matters. Um, it's going to be both. I hope we understand that prayer really does matter. And uh, at least this morning's study is about the matter of prayer. And um, I have to say that I really struggled in preparing this lesson. Um, it was one of the topics that was suggested by a member of the congregation that we ought to take a look at in this class. And it is, of course, a critically important element in the life of any church, um, and certainly in this one, and especially in this one at the beginning of 2011. Why might we think that prayer would be particularly important for us at the beginning of this new year, especially? Yes. Okay, it's a new year, it's a new opportunity. We do like to take this opportunity to, to make resolutions about things we're going to do differently. Uh, is there anything else? Donna? Okay, we are, I hope we are, uh, all getting excited, I know I certainly am, um, about what's going to happen this year as we roll out more aspects of the strategic plan. I was thinking about the ones that we've already seen, and it's, it's actually quite a few already. I think you could even say it started, maybe it didn't even start with this one, but the reasons to pray that we began to put out 34 weeks ago was something a little bit new and a little bit different. And uh, then, of course, the fact that we're now in this class dealing with subjects that are close to the hearts of folks in the congregation rather than just deciding what we think might be the best thing to do. The fact that we're having the Lord's Supper every week and the fact that uh, we're having the home Bible study groups, these are all things that have come from the Lord and have come out of uh, our determination that uh, we will, as God leads us, move forward as a congregation. And, um, so as we start 2011, to, to think that we could do all of that and not pray would be absurd in the extreme. So very, very important for us this year. What will be the sum total of our accomplishments for 2011 if we do not pray and if God is not with us in what we attempt to do? Let me put it up for you on the board. That will be it. At least in terms of any spiritual achievements. We could wear ourselves out in a lot of frenetic activity. And um, 
I've certainly known churches that have done that. Perhaps you have as well. There's a church in the Bible that was doing that, and everybody was very impressed with it. What was the name of that church? Brian. Uh, not Ephesus, no. Uh, they had left their first love, according to Revelation. Excuse me? Not the Corinthians. No, they had all kinds of moral problems. Starts with an S. And the next letter is an A. Sardis. What does the Lord Jesus Christ say about Sardis in his letters to the churches early on in Revelation? I see a Bible flipping open. They had a reputation. And it was a great reputation. Really good. It's the kind of church that you would want to go to based on the reputation that it had. Though I'm sure they had prayer meetings. Yeah. Can you remember what, uh, what the Lord Jesus said? You have a reputation for being... Brian. You have a reputation for being alive. But you are dead. That's what Jesus said about that church. Do we want to be Sardis in 2011? Do we want to be a church that uh, within the OPC and maybe further afield, people look at it and they say, you know, that church is alive. Just look at that church. How would they come to that opinion of us? How would people have the, the, the opinion that how would Sardis have gained this reputation that it was alive? Yeah, Brian. Yep, evangelism, what else? What do lots of churches love to do and have lots of Preaching, praying, activity programs. How many people have been to churches that have programs? Programs for young people, programs for children, programs for single people, programs for one-legged uh, ethnic minority people. Um, you know churches like that. No. But does it mean the church is alive? It can be. But Yeah. Well, it can be. I mean, I don't want to to get kind of sidetracked away from prayer for this subject, but if you think about it, the fact that all those programs are going on it could do two things. The first is it could divide the church into a lot of mini churches and little cliques. And I've been in churches where that has happened, where the young people get together and they don't seem to feel, even those who are true believers and love the Lord Jesus Christ, their concern and their focus and their fellowship is centered in the young people's group and not in a wider church. So there are some problems that you can experience. It's not wrong in itself, but what does it not mean that you are? doesn't mean you're alive. So if the Lord isn't with us in the things that we do in 2011, um, we run a very great risk of doing a lot of things and becoming a Sardis, having a reputation that we are alive, uh, but actually not being quite as alive as we might look. We don't want to be a sardis, Donna. Yeah, Psalm, Psalm 127, I think. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. So we want the Lord to build this house. How will that happen? It'll happen if we pray. Now, why did I struggle with this whole subject. I struggled because 
I looked back on our website at um, things we've done on prayer historically. And I actually have some of them here. I printed them out. Uh, prayer part one. This is uh, something to do with public worship. More specifically, public worship and prayer. Uh, actually, the prayer part one was more personal prayer and so on. Two things on public prayer, prayer in the public worship. And a whole series on the Lord's Supper, where the emphasis of which was um, very much to stimulate us to pray. And in those series, we backed right up to the beginning, uh, and it was a good thing to do. And we said, well, you know, the, the typical thing that you might expect to do, what is prayer? Um, who may pray? When should we pray? Where should we pray? What should we pray? How should we pray? And we covered all of that, and um, it's all been covered there quite a few times, and it hasn't been that long since we last did it. So plenty of stuff on our web about all of those things. Um, where might we go to understand why we should pray? Do we have any resources there that, that could help us? Yes, Bridget. The Psalms, yeah. Um, certainly we have examples of the prayers of godly men and women in Scripture. Donna? The Lord's Prayer. Um, if we were to go to our own internet resources, have we got anything there that might encourage us and tell us why it's a good thing to pray? Jerry? We have the church prayer list. Those are things to pray for, yeah. And certainly the needs there in and of themselves constitutes one reason why we should pray. Do we have any other reasons why we should pray? God says we should. He commands it. Anywhere else online, reasons to pray? I was thinking of it. Yes, but carry on. It doesn't matter. Okay. The parable of the unjust judge, the, the, the importunate prayer, the prayer that keeps... Pray without ceasing, yeah. Ask, seek, knock. Sean. <laughs> Not so far, no. Actually, today we're on reason number 34 uh, in our series on reasons to pray that's at the top of the bulletin every week. So currently, we have 34 reasons to pray, and they're all online. And uh, each week... We take the time, what you have on the, the bulletin is just a very short summary of, um, of the reason. If you actually go to the blog, it's developed into a few paragraphs of, of thought and encouragement around the specific topic to, uh, to try and encourage us in our prayer lives. So I started to think, well, there's all these things online. Um, and just the things that you've been contributing already tell me that if I were to ask you all the standard questions about prayer, because we've been so well taught, you would give me all the standard answers, and I would say, yes, very good, and we'd all feel very happy, and then we could go and have a cup of coffee. But I didn't want to do that. Um, and here's the reason why. Who in this room is not struggling with their prayer life today? Who has no struggles at all with prayer? Good, I'm not alone. Uh, we would expect to have struggles with prayer. Um, that's pretty obvious. We're in a spiritual battle. 
we all know, because we've been taught and, and we know it from experience, we all know how powerful and how effective prayer is. We've been taught about it. We've experienced it. And yet, we live in a kind of barren wilderness a lot of the time. And I'm not pointing fingers now. I have one finger very firmly pointed at myself. In other words, there is a huge disconnect between the things that we know and the things that we've been taught and maybe the things that we have experienced in our early Christian lives. We all know these things. We all know that prayer does matter. Um, we all know the things that we should be praying for. We could probably list off uh, the kind of characteristics that the person should have whose prayers God will hear. We could go through ACTS, you know, that, that, that acronym. Who knows what these things stand for? A is, you see what I mean? We know this. C is, confession. Whoops. T is, thanksgiving. And S, supplication. Whoops, with two S's at the beginning. That's quite important. So, we could go through that. We already know it. So, it wouldn't even contribute for most of us to the base of our knowledge. So, you can see the struggle that I had. I don't want to... Uh, at the beginning of 2011, I'm making a New Year's resolution for myself. I'm not going to spend time personally, going through stuff with you that you already know um, that isn't actually going to make a difference. Time's too short. You know, we're one year closer to our graves now, all of us, than we were this time last year. So I am determined by God's grace that 2011 is going to be different. It's going to be very different. And the strategic plan is just one part of it. We don't want to just do a lot of stuff and end up having a reputation that, we, we, that isn't a reality. Um, we have to be different. We have to draw closer to the Lord. We have the knowledge. But I think it's true to say very often we don't have the heart. That's a real issue, but that, I think, is, for many of us, the real issue. I remember when I was at school, um, I made the transition from one level up to the next level. Um, it was going to be a two-year course of study um, leading up to some exams for university entrance. And I worked my way through the first year, and it was very different in character to the stuff that I'd ever done before much more focused. I was only doing three subjects instead of uh, probably ten or a dozen. And uh, I was kind of floundering around for a little while. At least I thought I was okay. I probably wasn't working very hard. I didn't realize that at this level you actually had to do some work if you wanted to get any results. And I got to the end of that year and all three of my teachers, maths, chemistry, and physics, wrote on my report three words, effectively. Some of them actually used the words, others might just as well have done, because it's what their comments actually added up to. That's the first word. What do you think the others were? Two more words. Yep. Anybody else had a could do better report? Um, I kind of feel like that's my report for prayer in 2010. Could do better. In fact, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start the whole series on reasons to pray. 
because I needed to revisit them myself and uh, to understand just what the scriptures said about it. And it's kind of ironic um, that I end up then teaching the Sunday class on prayer. It's like when I was at the Christian Union in college, a very new believer, never been taught about giving or tithing or anything like that. And uh, I was suddenly appointed onto the executive committee of the Christian Union. Guess which position I was put in? Treasurer. Yeah, absolutely right. Oh, ooh, what, people give to this? It's a bit radical. Um, could do better. So, we've got lots of material that we could revisit, and that I don't want to um, in any way devalue that. It's good stuff, and it's there. Um, but we've all seen, we can go through Acts. We, we know quite a lot of this stuff off the top of our heads, so I don't really want to go there unless people really want to do that. And I'd certainly be happy to do that if that would be helpful. But what I would like to do is to hear from you what you think would be most helpful for us to do. And it could just finish this morning or it could go on for another few weeks. What are the things that you would like to do in connection with prayer matters so that our report at the end of 2011 won't be could do better? Well, it probably will be at one level. It will always be that. But our report will, compared to 2010 will be has done better. Yes. That's a useful caution, and uh, if, uh, if some folks on the other side didn't hear Thomas saying we need to be very careful making vows to the Lord about things that we will do, um, because he does take those things very seriously, and we certainly need to be mindful of that. Um, okay, so if we're, and, and, and that's right, let's not take vows unless we mean them. Um, but maybe that might be one way to encourage us to do better if, we, if our heart is in it, if it's not just empty words, and the Lord will know that. Um, what else might we do? Yes, Brigida. So the idea is there to be structured in how you use your time and put prayer at the top of the list because uh, we've all had those days when you think, oh, I've got so much time available today, I can spend quite a bit of it in prayer. But before I do that, let me just go and take care of this because I know that if I don't take care of this and I come to prayer, then I'll be worried about that and I won't be able to focus. So you go and do this and then you think, oh, yeah, one other thing. And then one other thing becomes two other things, and two other things becomes ten other things, and then it's time to go to bed. And you think, well, maybe tomorrow. So, yeah, put prayer first. Martin Luther certainly did that. He gave a good portion of his time every day at the beginning of the day to prayer. What else can we actually look at as a group? 
I have a suggestion. I'm trying to make this very practical. And to create a situation in which we can help each other. Because I think, quite frankly, we need all the help we can get. Okay, let's try this. Let's see if this helps. Okay. Bridget has already given us one. Other issues press in. That's one problem that we have in spending sufficient time in prayer. Maybe if we back up a little bit from this. Um, there are two areas where we might expect problems to arise. I think we can probably boil it down to two. Maybe there are three. One is certainly in terms of actually getting to prayer. But in Brigida's case, and in the case when we have those days, when we say, I really want to spend some time in prayer, then the heart is right. And the problem is in actually winning the battle to clear out the space and stop the other things from crowding in. So there are those kind of practical organization, um, how to actually get down and do the praying when you want to do it. That's one set of problems, and we can certainly spend some time looking at those, and maybe folks can help us with things that they've found to be helpful. But is there another problem? Jerry? Praying. Okay. Okay. How to pray effectively, and that's about focus. My writing's getting worse. Okay, one is one set of problems is around the actual doing. What's the other set of problems? In one case, you've got the heart, but you can't get the opportunity. What's the other situation? Right. <clears throat> that is, that's the other area where we're going to have problems, isn't it? One is in the practical scheduling and the, just the difficulty of being engaged in a spiritual warfare and preserving that time and giving it the priority that it should have. The other one is, and they could go together or they could be separate, you just don't feel like it sometimes. Or... You feel like it, but you're not really sure it's going to make a big difference. Um, another aspect of the spiritual warfare, Brigida.
okay? Okay, that might help us over here a little bit. I'll call that surrendered prayer. Thy will be done, as, as we say in the Lord's Prayer. Okay, let's try and fill in a little bit more in these columns. And uh, the problems that we have. Um, and the things that we have found to be helpful, or the things that we think might be helpful, but we're just just come to us this morning now that we're actually taking a look at this. Yep. Another thing I'm trying to be in 2011 is honest. Honest with myself. Honest with God honest with my brothers and sisters in the congregation because we spend I suspect and again I'm using the royal we which means usually means me spend a lot of time wearing a mask we want other people to believe that we've got it all together and we've got our family worship down and our quiet times are wonderful and we're living exemplary Christian lives. And we all know, at least I strongly sus I know it's not true in my case. I strongly suspect that it's not true in many cases in this room. And some of the things that happen, we shouldn't be sharing with one another, maybe just sharing in the household or just privately with the Lord. But there are other things where we're supposed to help each other. That's what being a body means. If I'm hurting here, suppose I've got a cut here. Okay, I'm bleeding and I'm bleeding. What am I going to do? Take care of it. How? If I look at it, well, I can't even do that, actually. Okay, so what, what could I do? Yeah, Brian. Okay. I could, at the very least, if it's a... If I need medical attention because I'm bleeding so fast, I can hold on to it or I could twist something up here. But that's one part of the body helping in a problem that's taking place in another part of the body, isn't it? And what we're going to see in our, you know, our Bible study, we're starting on um, this Wednesday. We're going to look at gifts and how the Lord has given gifts in the church and how they're given for the body. And now it's our responsibility to be using the gifts that the Lord has given us to build us all up and to care for us all and to comfort us and to bless us. And uh, that's what we need to do in this matter of prayer. It's no different. Um, except if we don't admit that we're having any issues, then nobody's going to offer to get alongside us and, and to help us. And sometimes that takes quite a lot of courage and quite a lot of trust because you, know, you kind of think that you confess you've got this terrible problem and somebody will say, oh, you have that problem? I've never had a problem with prayer. My prayer life is just going like this. I don't understand how you're having that problem. Snap out of it. You've got to trust that you're not going to get that kind of reaction because that's, that's not going to help. But as I said, I suspect that all of us know something of some problems here. Any other problems? No, no, please. Terrible. No, because you know some people do it. They feel a for doing that. And for me, I want to do that. But I don't know how you would feel about that. You know, never formed to it. 
I know, isn't it terrible being reformed sometimes? I know. Yes. It's absolutely okay. Yeah, well, I think we should be willing and able to pray for one another at any time. I think maybe we'd find a little room to go into and, and, and do it privately. Yeah. Brian, you had something. Yeah, that's what it, well, so many things boil down to that. Pride got started in the Garden of Eden, and it's been one of the worst afflictions of the human heart, and abhorrent in the sight of God. Yeah. Wouldn't it be something if uh, we could make some progress in, uh, sorry, that was English, progress in overcoming worldliness and pride, in overcoming our lack of desire and our lack of faith, our unbelief? I um, think that might help us pray more effectively, Brian. All right. Okay, it is progress. Donna. So those issues are around vulnerability. If somebody comes to you, as, as I said a little earlier, and they, they ask for prayer for a certain issue, 
don't give them a slap around the side of the head and, um, and say, don't be silly, pull yourself together. Um, I've never had that problem. Don't see why you should either. Um, respect the fact that they have opened themselves up and also respect the fact that they're trusting you with this information and before you share it with anybody else, check with them and say, well, I really appreciate that. Let's pray about it now. Oh, and by the way, you know, there's somebody else I know who may be really able to help. I think they went through something like this recently. Would you be willing for me to, to share this with them and maybe they could, could help too? So they have to be very careful going down this path. Brigida. So how do we get to a place where we feel safe, where we feel that we could share some issues, whatever they might be, and we're not going to get slapped, and we're not going to get put down, and we are going to be taken seriously, we are going to be taken on people's hearts for prayer, and, and we can trust that that information is going to be kept uh, in confidence. How do we get there? Right. So you get to greater levels of approachability by starting by <laughs> and being a little bit approachable. Um, and you grow in it. You don't leap into it in one, in one swell poop. I'm going to take a few minutes now to suggest something else. I was talking with Sean about this um, yesterday. And this could turn out to be another new initi initiative arising from the thinking that we're doing, the planning. All, all of this study this morning um, really traces its roots back to the fact that we've begun to seek after the Lord because we're not content to stand still anymore. We want to be what we can be as a fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. So here is an idea, and it's a suggestion. It's something that I think it would be great if it happened, but it's not going to be organized and dictated and scheduled and so on and so forth. Here's the idea. Uh, where shall I put this? Well... Prayer, that would be good. Prayer partners. Anybody know how that might work? Here's, here's how I think it might work. Um, we can refine it or whatever. There are people that you feel comfortable with. Um, ladies, I would suggest this should be other ladies. Men, I think this should be other men. There are people that you already have a level of trust 
and confidence in, people whose uh, understanding you respect, people um, that you're, you're already a, some way down the path to, to having that kind of relationship that we've been talking about. Supposing you were to approach one or two others, so you have little groups of two or three, and you say to them, would you be my prayer partner? Well, what does a prayer partner do? Okay. One. They might. This is not in order of priority. Pray for you. Two. How about if they encourage you to pray? How's your prayer life been going this week? Have you managed to find that time every day? Is that something I can be praying about for the coming week, that you will be able to overcome those obstacles and those difficulties so that you'll get that time and that desire and you'll pray. So it's a form of accountability, isn't it? You know that at a certain point in time you're going to meet with your prayer partner or partners and they're going to say, how's it going? And they're not going to slap you around the head when you say, you know, I haven't had one prayer time this week. Will you pray for me? Will you help me? Um, and they'll say, yeah, of course, let's pray now. What else? Pray with you. Um, we don't want to create an awful extra burden, so that's, that's why this is a suggestion. Okay? It's, not a, it's something that I think personally would be a wonderful thing if we could do this in the church, but it's not something that's the law of the Medes and the Persians. Bridgeta. Absolutely right, yeah, it's because it's coming down into little groups. There's still little groups of people in this fellowship, um, but it, it enables you to pray for things that perhaps you wouldn't mention in a, in a bigger group or, or whatever. Um, I can think of one more, um, and that would be urge attendance. Where else might we urge one another to be present. Okay. Reasons to pray. I will see you at the prayer meeting. This is an issue that we could bring to that larger group. Some issues we may not be able to do that. Some we certainly could. Let's bring it to the prayer meeting on Wednesday and, and get all the brothers and sisters together um, seeking the Lord for it. So how does that sound? Does that sound like something that we might want to do? Something that could be helpful? Worth a try? Donna. I'll announce it. That, uh, yeah, I kind of got there in my thinking as well. <laughs> so, I will announce it, and um, 
I'll draw attention to these possibilities as well. Okay, we're getting towards the end of our time today. I hadn't planned to do more than one lesson, but there are some more things that we could cover in these areas. If people would like to do that, is, would you like to come back next week and take another look at this and maybe we can report back how the early prayer partnerships have been forming and whether it's going in a good direction. That's something we'd like to do. One thing I did have here, in case this entire lesson tanked and I didn't have the courage to go down the particular path that we did go down, is examples um, of some of the, the real prayers in Scripture. You know, uh, I, I do have a passage here. Let's turn to this passage because this it amazes me every time I read it. If I can find it now, of course. Don't tell me I deleted it. Well, it's in Jeremiah. And the Lord has prophesied judgment against his people. And he says to Jeremiah, you know, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, I would still continue with my judgment against my people. And I'm thinking, wow, imagine being such a person of prayer before God that, and I'll pick a few people here, yeah. even if Jerry Barlow stood before me now and prayed, you know, my mind is made up, I'm still going to do this. What does that mean? It means that when Jerry Barlow stands before the Lord, his presence and his prayers are of such a character that most of the time, God is going to turn from something that he has declared he'll do, or he's going to listen, he's going to hear those prayers. And there are some fantastic examples in the Old Testament. Um, some of my favorite passages are dialogues between Abraham and the Lord, for example, between Jacob and the Lord, between Moses and the Lord. People who prayed and the Lord turned from the thing that he said that he would do. Now, we all instantly get into theology and God's sovereignty and, well, he was never going to do it anyway and all that stuff. The point is, without the prayers, you know, we are led to believe the prayer was an integral part of God's plan to spare his people or to bless them or whatever. Imagine becoming more like a, an Abraham or a Jacob or a Moses. It's that effective prayer. That's why I picked on Jerry. That effective prayer point that he mentioned. How do we pray effectively? So looking at the examples of some of these characters could be good. And we'll leave up some of the, uh, some of the solutions here as well. We'll try, uh, those of us who really would like to do this, um, we'll try a system of prayer partnering and, um, and we'll come back next week and, and take a look at some of these other issues. That sound okay? I hadn't cleared this with Pastor Bryant, he, uh, but that's okay. Okay, that's what we'll do. Let's, let's come back next week and uh, let's really seek the Lord so that 2011 is, is going to be different. Let's give ourselves to that. Let's pray together, shall we, as we close.